Hi, everybody. I'm Joy Forrest with Call to Peace Ministries, and I'm here with my good friend Chris Moles today. How are you, Chris? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. I'm looking forward to uh, talking with you today. Same here. So I invited Chris. Um, Chris and I are, are good friends, and I like uh, to, to actually pick Chris's brain quite a bit. We, he actually works with perpetrators of abuse while I work with victims, but I love your, um, I think it's on your website. It says that you are, you actually are a victim's advocate because you. Oh, uh, I would say, mom. yeah, I would say that um, the greatest means of reducing violence against women is addressing the hearts of men. And so our take on ministry is we want to serve women and children uh, well by speaking to men, uh, both bystanders, bystanders and uh, perpetrators on, uh, yeah, taking a stand against violence against women and really standing up for the truth of scripture. Absolutely. And I mean, I've been doing this work for 20 years. And what I find is that if they, you know, if even if a woman gets out of a bad situation and moves on, uh, perpetrators are just going to go to their next victim. So I really appreciate the work you do. And I do think it is um, very valuable to survivors. In fact, I've had many who come up to me and tell me that because of you, um, their church changed the way they were handling this. Or I've had even had a couple who've told me that their marriages were saved. And we know as advocates that that is a very rare thing. It's a very hard thing to accomplish, but it's nothing's impossible with God. And it would be contrary to the gospel to say that it isn't possible. Um, <clears throat> so recently I had an experience where um, somebody came to me and they were telling me that their friend got mad at them. They were a, a, a victim of domestic violence. They were in a really tough situation and their, their friend who was trying to help came along and started telling them what they needed to do. You need to do this, this, and this. And then when she okay. wouldn't do it, the lady got mad and pulled off, pulled back her support, which was the only support this lady had. So you and I've also talked about how, victims, advocates, if they don't know what they're doing, can, or even people who want to help can actually end up hurting people. And so that's why I want to kind of go through and talk through what good advocacy looks like. And one of the things I appreciate about you, you and I have very similar training because you tell me, just tell a little bit about your background as far as even in a uh, secular setting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, I'm just kind of a unique uh, blend of being equipped and trained in the secular world. So I've been uh, certified through our Family Protection Services Board in a variety of batterer intervention curriculums, uh, as well as training from uh, agencies like Duluth, um, the DAIP. But my uh, primary training is in biblical counseling and theology. And so I have my undergrad is in comprehensive Bible, my master's degree is in biblical counseling. And so God's been real faithful to take me on these parallel tracks of learning from uh, DAIP and the Family Protection Services Board, the State Coalition, and um, as many people as I can. I, I love to learn. I need to learn um, because uh, that's really transformative is education. But at the same time, filtering that through the gospel and um, the scriptures has been tremendous. So I think the view, and this is where we share that, you know, the view of the need for progressive sanctification and the sufficiency of scripture combined with the observational data from the world, I think has been tremendous in helping me as a caregiver, a counselor, and a confronter. But I also think it's imperative for us as people helpers as we step into a victim's world and walk along and provide support for them. Yeah. And I have, I'm similar to you in that I have a background of, of working at a secular domestic violence shelter before going back and getting my biblical counseling um, degree. So uh, I, I tell people, look, the world's been out there doing it for 30 years when the church was absent and, mm -hmm. and they have made great observations. And as a former victim myself, I know that um, so many of the things that I learned through the secular, um, you know, training that I've had basically really rang true for me as a, as a, as a former victim. So um, in that vein, what I would like to do is I actually just um, have put together a really quick PowerPoint presentation that I wanted to go through on how to help. I really ought to name this what not to do or <laughs> how to make things way worse. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but um, anyway, we just, we definitely want to be able to, um, 
help people in a way that's effective. And we're not going to do that if we try to take charge. So we're going to talk about how that looks, but I've got to figure out how to do a screen share all of a sudden. I don't see it. I've never had this happen. All right. Where's the screen share button? There it is. Sorry about that. Get You're fine. Here. We'll get it. All right. So I got to pull this up. Here we go. And that's not what I meant to. Guys, I'm not really prepared, but you're much better at this, Chris, than me. <laughs> <laughs> All right, there we go. Right. Do don'ts for people helpers, okay? <clears throat> All right, so number one, let's talk about connecting them with resources. So let's say you don't have all the answers. Um, a lot of times people head to their churches and the churches, you know, they, they want to take care of it in-house. So let's talk about some of the resources that you would recommend. Oh, absolutely. And this is, this is criticism that, um, that a lot of pastors receive, rightfully so, because we are accustomed in many ways to handling things in-house, as you say. But there are community agencies and resources available to you uh, that you can avail yourself to if you're willing to be, as you said earlier, if you're willing to practice a little bit of humility, have a teachable spirit. For me, my go-tos in our community and I live in a small community, so it's not like we're overwhelmed with resources. My go-tos in uh, our community are our local community-based shelter, our community-based advocates. Uh, I also have a great relationship with local law enforcement. We have in our small sheriff's department one officer designated for domestic violence. Um, I have a good relationship with our child um, abuse uh, the detective or investigator through the police department and all of those relationships I built over time. So the first thing I would say is get connected to the people who are doing the work. The best place to find them are through the shelter or through uh, a local stop team or domestic violence task force. And you could find that out maybe through local law enforcement. The second set of resources that I think are really, really essential are theologically based resources. Um, so, anything that's been written from a Christian perspective. And I know some Christians don't like that. They're like, oh, we only have to have our particular vein, our particular perspective, but there's great resources out there. Uh, obviously, I'm going to be biased towards the work that you and I have produced. Um, my friend Leslie Vernick has produced some exceptional work. Mm -hmm. Justin and Lindsay Holcomb, their book, uh, Is It My Fault, is a really good primer to get people started. Uh, but those are the places that I would I would go is just a, a few books, but then also individual people mm -hmm. in our, my community. Yeah. And also, I mean, like call to peace, we have um, online support groups. One thing that we want to do in our ministry is to help go in and start training advocates or folks to be advocates within their faith community, the, within their churches to, you know, <clears throat> give that victim a, a second, uh, a voice or a support system within the church. We think that's important, but you also need to reach out for outside services, people who are experts in domestic violence. So I just, I listed some things, you know, even legal, sometimes it might be yeah. good to have an attorney that you can speak to or, um, but, it, but by all means, education is like number one. And if you're a victim of a domestic violence crime, then you actually, and you know this, uh, in most states, you have access to legal aid and specific resources. In fact, even knowing uh, victims' rights, and you can get that from your advocate, knowing what your state provides and what's provided federally in the way of victims' rights can be a helpful hot sheet or a list to have in your side drawer so you can connect them to resources that, that maybe otherwise they wouldn't know about. Yeah. And uh, it, that really does vary from state to state sometimes. But um, we're going to be making a list of resources to put on our website because I understand there are some national um, uh, advocacy groups, actually attorney groups that might be willing to help from state to state. And, you know, they will help here in North Carolina with protective orders, but they won't help with custody issues at all. Right. So right. I mean, that's a big deal. But we're not going to go into all that now. Uh, so like uh, number one, I, I probably should have put this as number one. This is number two in my little list, but listen and don't try to take charge. To me, it's so important not to tell somebody what to do. We're talking to, about a person who has been told what to do. They've been in a relationship. They've been controlled. They don't need somebody else trying to direct them. And I would say that would go for don't you leave or do leave. I mean, we get people trying to tell them both ways and we don't respect what they want. 
Yeah. And um, so I've, I actually list, listed some reasons that why, you know, reasons we shouldn't try to take charge. Um, you know, they're, you're going to lose their trust. And again, they don't need more control. Yeah. But we do need to help them explore options instead, right? Yeah. So I tell um, our trainees, our people that we work with, that um, if we're dealing within the Christian or the church context, this individual already has a savior, right? And his name is Jesus. And so they don't need another Messiah to swoop in and be the benevolent rescuer. And then secondly, they already have uh, an oppressor and they, they need empowerment, not mm -hmm. further instruction as far as further dictating to them what to do. And so in advocacy work, we're running kind of a, um, a very specific rail on the process, which is we're representing them to um, the, the folks around them. And then we're also listening and supporting their wishes. So it's a difficult, sometimes line to, to walk because many times in the Christian world, we want to give specific instruction, make demands, set consequences. But that is absolutely the, the last thing that, that a victim needs. Uh, and then to your point, when you opened up the, the discussion today, I think the thing I run into the most, well, I'll give you two examples. I think there are two things I run into the most from a Christian perspective. One is the benevolent rescuer, the person who is desperate for their safety uh, to the point that they want to make decisions for the victim. But they don't know the perpetrator like the victim does. They don't know the victim's circumstances. They haven't gathered all the data as far as all of her fears and and resistance and hesitancy. And they just want to push through because they want it so desperately. And when the victim doesn't go along or uh, a trained advocate or somebody who's trained like, like, like someone in our position comes along and tells the rescuer to back off, they get offended, um, you know, and, and really upset because honestly they desperately want to help. Then the second uh, person I encounter the most are uh, really, and for lack of a better word, really angry folks, maybe who've been there before. Uh, they're operating from a place of hurt and they are projecting their own hurt, pain and experience on the victim. I, I think survivors make wonderful advocates. And I do think that I think survivors make the best advocates. However, I always recommend that it occurs after they've experienced their own healing and growth Amen. And have and have really experienced God's grace. If they continue to operate out of their hurt, they they tend not always to project that hurt and want the their victim to respond the way they wish they had responded. Mm -hmm. But every case is so distinct; you have to be objective. And I'm going to add a third one. Okay. So mo many of the women that we work with will go to their churches, and their churches take strong directions: you cannot leave, you cannot separate. Yep. And maybe because they haven't seen any physical violence and you and I both know that there is a extreme, there's an extremely thin line between physical abuse and, and the emotional, oh, yeah. um, verbal, the, uh, you know, destructive, uh, toxic kinds of relationships that we deal with, and, you know, it can cross the line at any moment. And so um, for a church to be doing that is oftentimes putting somebody in danger. It's forgetting the welfare of that, that woman and her children. Yeah. And so that would be my third is that you should not ever take that such, such a strong stand. There's nothing wrong with separation for the sake of safety. Right. We're not talking about promoting a divorce here. We're just saying, let somebody get out and be safe. Yeah. And, you know, I think the other side, this is really, I'm really glad you brought this up because, um, you know, recently I, I was hit pretty hard. Uh, somebody had kind of, had kind of attacked me pretty hard. Um, saying that I was promoting that. And I, somebody had emailed me or reached out to me and they had heard me say um, something about a victim who was staying. And, and my take has always been, if a victim wants to stay and they're not in uh, life-threatening danger, I need to respect that, understand why they want to stay and, and help them stay well. Um, and I think I had said something very briefly about that and a, an individual had taken it as, um, because they had heard from their church so many times exactly what you're saying. Well, Pastor Chris must think the same thing. Mm -hmm. And I can't believe he's telling women to stay. Mm -hmm. And that's that's a really not a reflection of, of my words or even that individual's heart. I think it's a reflection of the culture where churches have really held that line so much. You're just accustomed to hearing it. Yeah. Well, and, but sadly, um, <laughs> 
trying to force them to leave is just as bad as trying to force them to stay. Yeah. So uh, next step, the next thing that I have listed is do not betray their confidence. Why? Because this can put them in further danger. And I see this quite often, um, in fact, especially a lot of times within the church dynamic, maybe somebody will finally get up the nerve to go and tell their pastor. And then the pastor Mm -hmm. turns around and automatically confronts. Right. Right. Yeah, this is a huge problem, Joy. And I think there's such a balancing act here, too, because good, solid churches that practice church discipline and practice biblical care understand that biblical confidentiality is quite different from, say, a licensed counselor or attorney-client privilege. Um, There are many cases we have to tell someone for the sake of the body. The dilemma here is what ends up happening is exactly what you said. The pastor receives a disclosure, and rather than practicing good advocacy, which involves first listening, second, gathering good, solid information, third, providing support, he immediately goes into confrontation mode. And uh, we need to plan for that. And I tell pastors this all the time. If you don't plan for confrontation, um, you, you will be outdone. More than likely, the, the batterer or the abuser is far more skilled at conflict and manipulation than you are at conflict resolution. So we need to plan for confrontations with victim consent and consistent with any outside influence, such as court orders or civil orders, if that, if the government's been involved. Yes. I mean, and this one, tie, the next one ties into it. Um, again, like we said before, if you do that, you're, they're going to lose their trust in you and they might yeah. not tell you anything again in the future. So you want to make sure you keep those lines of communication open by, you know, not betraying their confidence. The next thing would be help them make a safety plan. Um, there are lots of resources out there. They could, you can send them to your local domestic violence agency. Um, you know, shelters, whatever, they can help them with a safety plan. And I also know you always mention that Focus Ministries has one on their website, Mm -hmm. which is what, Focus One, what is it? Focus Ministries, the number one, dot O-R-G. I still believe as many resources as we have now. I mean, can you believe in the last five years how many resources we have compared to where we were? Uh, I still contend that Focus Ministries has the most robust and full um, library of resources on their website. We have a lot of great stuff for sure. And uh, I have a tremendous amount of respect for Paula Silva. And so I recommend their safety plan. It's extensive. um, So you don't have to do it all. Safety plans can be as simple as what phone numbers are you going to call? Where are you going to go? Who is going to support you to as complex as having all of your financial details in order, having um, law enforcement contacts. It can be as simple, as complex as you need for the sanity and the safety of the client or the counselee or the victim in this case. But I do recommend focus because I think there's so many options in there. If you've never done a safety plan, it can help you think through uh, how to do a safety plan. The thing that we use locally are shoe cards. If you're familiar with those small cards and they have our numbers on them, who to contact and from the hospital all the way down to uh, law enforcement. Yeah. And as an advocate, one thing I do is I'll actually sit down and help them come up with those points. So let's talk about it. Let's say if you've got children, can we have a signal so that the children know to run next door to, you know, call the police if it gets dangerous or, um, you know, where are we going to, maybe some stash the money away, just different things. Um, so, you know, have being able to work through that ahead of time rather than going straight over to the abuser and confronting him and getting her into more danger, um, then that is going to be a lot more effective if you yeah. can plan it ahead. Yeah. <clears throat> so I have here provide pr- practical support as the next one. And that could be anything. I mean, it's just like the ladies that, whoops, sorry, went back. I don't go back. <laughs> the ladies that we work with, Um, a lot of times are facing just insurmountable uh, barriers. They, uh, I had one lady recently whose husband, um, she asked him to leave because of violence. He left, he took both cars and every penny from their account. She was a stay at home um, housewife. And so she needed housing, she needed transportation. Um, And so those things, you know, it would be wonderful if especially churches would come alongside. I've heard some churches starting to do that. I had one here recently in our, in the Raleigh area 
who actually paid the deposit for an apartment for one of the ladies in their congregation. And it just made my heart sing because this is what we, you know, we see such a great need all the time and very few people coming forward to meet that need. Um, and then the last thing I have is accompanying them to court. I know that when I had to go and get my protective order, I was scared to death for about the walk from the car into the courtroom because I could have come across them anywhere along that way. Yep. Uh, so especially in the, in the protective order type of situation, if it has been mentioned or it has been a tool that you've used in the past, in most counties around the country, uh, DVPs or uh, personal safety orders, are it, it can be a mad dash to the courthouse. So I have had victims and perpetrators both arriving at the courthouse in kind of a cannonball run type of race to see who can get there first to, to hear them, get the magistrate's ear. Yeah. Uh, because those emergency orders are, are usually put in place. Like it, it's, it's usually, at least in our county, uh, EPOs are put into place pretty quickly before they can go to a family lawmaster in, you know, the following week. And so we have had perpetrators foul uh, emergency protective orders um, against their victim. Oh. And of course, usually those get reversed. If you've got a good family law judge, uh, that you don't want to file a false report. <laughs> he'll light, you know, they'll light you up usually. Yeah. Uh, the other thing that churches especially can do is this aspect of housing, transportation, job skills, resume building, um, yeah. things like that. We have an abundance of resources. I know of one church in the biblical counseling movement, uh, one of our more significant churches around the country, they have an entire house that's a partnership with an automobile manufacturer. They built a, a house uh, for victims of domestic violence and the local um, law enforcement shelter. They all know that the house is there. So if they need more of a extended stay, extended housing, maybe six months or so, then they can contact the church and it's, it's home. And, uh, you know, people refurbish it every time with uh, handmade quilts and stuffed animals for the kids and uh, incredible ministry. And then, uh, uh, of course, with the aspect of having good advocates, once an advocate has walked the trail themselves, they've made that walk into the courthouse, they've talked to the right people, they're connected to the team. It's so much easier than a victim navigating it, uh, navigating water she's never been in before, where an advocate has done it time and time and time again. And churches can do that. There are retired uh, ladies, there are people within the church that have time and a ministry servant heart, they can do that work and we have it in abundance. So we've just got to, we just got to step out in faith and do it. Yeah. And I would, I would love to see more and more of that. That's what we're trying to do in our ministry is to actually help train people to walk along, you know, just to help mm -hmm. them walk alongside and yeah. um, provide that practical support. And there's so many things I didn't list here, uh, childcare. I mean, we're looking at a lot of times it can be, it, it's very typical for the clients we see to be homeschooling moms of five or six kids sometimes. Yep. And they don't have job skills. They haven't worked in years. They might have some job skills, but they haven't worked in years. And if they are going to go and get a job, it wouldn't even pay them to put their kids in childcare. So we're looking at, you know, just an array of different barriers, but um, maybe for the ones who have two or three children, just finding somebody to babysit the kids while they go for job interviews or while they go for we actually connect them to a um, there's a program here that does career career counseling and so yeah. we, we prefer a lot of our clients out there but anyway yes. those practical you know, things are so important one thing i would even share for maybe pastors that are watching um some of the states that p churches that i work with they're in um states that have legal separation and uh, I have encountered so many churches that are, that are so fearful of divorce that they've really um, overstepped what we're talking about. And they just really made demands and expectations that she not file legal separation. The, the issue there is that legal separation can be a, a great protection for her, especially financially. Yeah. And um, it, it is unfortunate that we've had some churches that have really drugged their feet on helping and it's left uh, victims in particular without the financial means. And of course, the number one reason women go back into abusive relationships is financial. Yes. And so um, it's imperative that we allow them to participate in the system that's mm -hmm. going to protect them. Legal separation is not always a precursor for divorce. Of course, divorce and, and marriage is not our primary focus. God's glory is yes. um, and honoring him and providing for safety. But 
it's not always a precursor. It could be a great protection. And uh, the numbers of men who claim to be Christians in our churches who do not provide for their families is astonishing. And of course, according to uh, you know Paul's letters, uh, pastoral letters, a person who doesn't provide for his family is worse than an unbeliever. Yeah. So there's, that's a great evidence that, that a guy isn't even a believer when he withholds support or he empties those bank accounts. And so uh, I think uh, that's another area that churches really should become aware of is if their state provides for legal separation and what that is and what it isn't. Yeah, that's a great point. I, we had a case here locally where the church dragged their heels for about a year and told her she could not file for legal separation. And he did exactly that. He emptied out the bank accounts and yeah. pretty much has left her financially devastated. He's not even paying child support right now. And a lot of times these guys who are self-employed, they can hide money. And <clears throat> so we're looking at people who have become completely devastated, um, you know, based on bad advocacy or counseling so yeah. um, at least this is just so important um, we could probably go on oh yeah more there's probably a lot more we could say about that but yeah. i'm going to keep this one a little shorter <laughs> <laughs> so um i would say encourage them to resist mistreatment um i think leslie burnick's got the best stuff out there on this yep. uh, her books the emotionally destructive relationship and the emotionally destructive marriage she talks about building core strength and being able to stand up to sin yeah. Well, I think that as Christian women, a lot of times we think we have to submit to everything, but what we're doing is we're actually promoting somebody's sin mm -hmm. um, when we, uh, you know, don't say no uh, and we don't learn to, to stand up against yeah. it. So um, sometimes that will make things worse if you happen to still be in the relationship. So again, you have to have a safety plan. You have to talk it through. You have to figure out how that's going to look. But if once you're out, you also, for our, the ladies in our group, we teach them to go no, no contact because the more you, you can't have an argument and win with somebody who is abusive, um, they're just going to use it as a power play. They yeah. will, um, they'll twist every word you say and, and they don't really get what you're saying or yeah. they at least act like they don't. Um, yeah. The other thing would be support groups so they get more educated and they can um, help build, again, their their core strength and learn to say no and to resist sin, but not in a sinful way. Yeah. I love that because I think that that's something that we encounter quite a bit in the law enforcement side is um, ladies who unfortunately have been arrested for domestic violence crimes. But when you, the vast majority of them, when you pull back the curtain, they're resisting, uh, they're using uh, illegal forms of resistance. And so we do talk great deal about um, resisting well, resisting biblically. And uh, I get some heat for that too. I get some folks who just, I don't know what we expect people to do, but my experience has been when you resist sinfully, all the attention comes upon you and the perpetrator just is, he just, we just have a blind spot for him and everything goes back um, to the victim. The only thing I would add to this is it is nice to have a voice after the fact, meaning once you establish your core strength, you're involved in support activities, having an ally on your team that can then communicate boundaries and consequences and be able to unpack that is really helpful for, from my perspective. And that's primarily a job that I do. It's not a fun job. It's not like I'm excited to go to work every day, but that is a pretty consistent thing that we do in our ministry is many of the men that I work with are really self-deceived or blind or they have blind spots, uh, even if I could be kind in that regard. And so it's important to push back and say, no, your wife has set these boundaries, right? And now it's your responsibility, how you treat the boundaries or these are consequences and be sure your sins will find you out. We can't escape the consequences. So having somebody who's willing to kind of define those terms, because you've probably experienced that a victim sets boundaries, sets consequences, and the perpetrator, along with all of his allies, are kind of shaking their head going, we don't understand what's happening. It's nice to have you know, clear definitions and a team of people uh, helping educate everybody from the perpetrator through the pastor through um, the advocates. Well, and this is where I think that the church can actually be so much more effective than the world, because I do have a situation right now working with the church and the church is holding him accountable. Mm -hmm. They are setting those boundaries for him. They are, um, you know, walking alongside and telling him, no, this is not okay. This is okay. Where, you know, the world doesn't have a system set up that could, could walk alongside like that. And so this is where churches could be so powerful if they will, um, you know, be willing to, to roll up their sleeves and get messy. Yeah. 
because it isn't yeah. it's not an easy thing to deal with but that's what i believe the body of christ ought to be doing there's a lot more freedom and accountability within the church too speaking as somebody who's who's worked in both worlds from a judicial standpoint the system does not have a soul the people in the system do but the system will chew you up and spit you out and there's so much bureaucracy i know for us even within a perpetrator accountability group our hands are tied somewhat on who we can contact and how we can contact them and so thankfully we have great advocates who do great work but if you've got an overwhelmed advocate and you've got an interventionist who has his hands or her hands tied something's going to slip through the cracks it's just going to happen where the church you've got a body that's functioning together so yeah i agree with you yeah especially once they've gotten a little bit of training you know and, and they know what not to do <laughs> so yeah the knots are as, as, as important as the do's so, um encourage them to find their hope in god um for for me i know i've been an advocate for a long time now and one of the things that um happened in the very beginning when I was starting to help people and I hadn't been out that long. I, ha I feel like I was healed significantly. It didn't hurt me to even talk about it anymore. But um, I remember thinking, Oh God, what am I going to do? This woman's situation is impossible. And it was mm. as if he was saying, um, wait a minute, your situation was impossible and I was enough for you. So, you know, really helping them to connect with God is so huge to let him know that he, his heart is for those who are oppressed and he is on their side because a lot of times when somebody's lived through abuse, they really think that God is against them. Sometimes their uh, partner, their, their spouse has used scripture against oh, yeah. them. You have to submit. I am the head of this house. God yeah. hates divorce. They will use scriptures. They take them out of con context and twist them so much that we start thinking God is not good and he's not for us anymore. Um, but you look in the Old Testament, it is loaded with passages about his heart for the oppressed. Uh, more so, he had, there's a lot more to say about that than that one passage where it says he hates divorce, which means <laughs> putting away. We won't go into that today. We don't have time for that one. <laughs> That's right. Um, but also that he is on their side. I just think about Romans uh, 8, chapter 8. You know, if God is for us, who can be against us? And like, you know, what can separate us from his love? Nothing. But I find that these women that I, that we work with a lot, I don't know his goodness anymore in their lives. And um, also, you know, they don't know who they are in, in him. They don't know yeah. their value to God. Right. So. Yeah. I think the identity piece is huge. And we, um, we talk about this a great deal too. And I think we had this conversation just this month in PeaceWorks University talking about identity uh, with uh, Elise Fitzpatrick that, mm -hmm is so easy to find our identity in the things that were said about us, declared about us, um, the, the things that we believe about ourselves based upon the shame of other people's sin, but our identity is in Christ and the work that he has done. And there's a great deal of freedom in that. So there, I mean, there's, I, you can't find any disagreement from me on this one, Joy, as we're placing our hope in God. Part of that is, identifying and realizing who we are in Christ that I no longer live, but the life I live, I live by faith in the son of God. Uh, so this idea of being adopted, redeemed, forgiven, um, these are truths that we have to keep telling to ourselves and to those folks in our lives who've been told that they're ugly, that they're shameful, that they're uh, less than, that been minimized, we need to give them the truth of the gospel, that they've been redeemed, that they've been reformed, that they have a new life. Well, I could go on and on and on because our identity in Christ is so significant yeah. from putting off a label, right, of just being a victim yes. to finding victory mm -hmm. is a huge process. And I find that those victors, those survivors become incredible advocates. Yeah, absolutely. When they heal, Yep. They are incredible yep. advocates. Yep. When they haven't healed. A lot of times it, it can become real messy and ugly. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, that's wonderful. And, and since you mentioned PeaceWorks University, I'm going to put a plug in here. So <laughs> I'm, I'm going to put it at the end of the, the, uh, the slideshow presentation as well. But Chris has an amazing resource for anybody who wants to learn more about how to deal with folks who are, um, experiencing domestic abuse and you know especially it's i think it was created mostly for people helpers we do i think you have some 
survivors in mm-hmm. there. Yeah, there's some survivors in there. <clears throat> but it's on it's at his website, chrismoles.com. And right now it's still is it still twelve dollars a month or it's gone to fifteen? It's now fifteen dollars a month or hundred and fifty dollars for the year. Mm-hmm. So you yep. save a little money back doing the yearly. But mm-hmm. it's an amazing resource, I, I have to say. I mean you've got hours and hours, maybe thirty hours in the um, we're we're a little over 40 hours of video content, uh, multiple free ebooks, homework assignments, infographics, and then of course the community. Um, we do a live Q and A every month, and uh, we have a private Facebook group for our members. And we're now right at 95 members, um, so uh, we have a little bit more room to grow. So we would love to have some more folks participating. It's it's been a real treat for me. Like I've been surprised by Peace Force yeah. University and, and really glad to be able to lead that. Well, it's a great resource. I mean, because even in the Facebook group, if you've got a question or a problem, you can just post it immediately and get people responding to it. So mm-hmm. I think it's just like one of the best resources I've seen mm-hmm. for people helpers. Um, I, I appreciate that. And, I, and we did gear it towards people helpers because as you know, most of the online resources out there, rightfully so, I would not begrudge it at all, are geared towards victims and so it is a different tenor and a different objective. Um, so it's a much uh, a easier place to ask questions about people helping, because um, you do know in a lot of other forums, you have to do a lot of people helping. So in a lot of forums, you're doing a lot of ministry. And in our forum, our private group, you're doing a lot of uh, interacting, learning. Yeah. Thank you. So here's the thing. One of the reasons I think that people want to push victims of domestic violence is because a lot of times they're going to resist whatever it is you do, whether you tell them to go or whether you tell them to stay, they're going to resist. Yeah. Um, but you shouldn't be telling them. You should be giving them options. But, and this is why you need to be very patient with them. They may not even consider their relationships abusive. I, I, a lot of the folks that come to our support groups have been referred to us by counselors. And we spend usually the first two classes <clears throat> defining finally helping them admit that the, that it was abusive. Mm-hmm. Oh, well, he didn't ever, he never really hit me. And basically he, you know, he might've shoved me a few times and yeah, I was afraid of him. And, but no, we, we didn't have to, we didn't have violence going on in our home right. every day. It was maybe once or twice a year. So they don't see it as abusive. Mm-hmm. Um, they might, they have definitely been conditioned to cover up and hide the abuse, you know, especially the more high profile an abuser is. And we do find people who are high profile pastors, um, attorneys, doctors, you know, police officers, they've been taught to cover up and hide that abuse. They, they've been taught to, to protect their abuser mm-hmm. and they do not want to leave their relationships. And we yeah. have to honor and respect that. Um, even though like what I will say to a woman you know, I know you don't want to leave, but I feel like this is dangerous. And I've been doing this for many years now. And what I have seen, the only thing that really works in these kinds of situations is some kind of consequence and separation is usually the best consequence. Um, so that is kind of, you know, telling them their options, but I don't say you need to get out and you need to get out now. Unless right. you know, I think it's really life threatening. Right. You have a lethality index for that. But, um, you know, in most cases, we just got to talk through their options. Yeah. And they don't think they can survive on their own, which we've already alluded to, um, you know, financially, it could be financial or it could be just a host of other reasons that they don't think that they can survive if they leave the relationship. We, um, this reminded me too of, of a lot of pushback I've received from pastors uh, over the years of, you know, giving up too soon. And they'll say things like, we've tried, we've tried everything. I don't think she wants help because there is, and and I don't mean this in a derogatory way. So, so please hear my heart on this. The amount of wishy washy ness we experience in the process, we cannot get discouraged by that. And we have to understand that that's part of the process, the coming and the going, the uncertainty, the confusion. Uh, And I, I I hate to just keep plugging it, but you know, that we have a master's class in PeaceWorks University on complex uh, post-traumatic stress with an expert who reminded us that, Um, PTS and then complex PTS, which is the the trauma is still ongoing and developing that the limbic system, I think it is in our brain is functioning normally. Like this is how we're designed to function under intense situations is that our brain captures everything. So if you're at a heightened state of hypervigilance for years, you you can't expect an individual to be able to, um, 
I don't want to say comprehend, but function, function effectively, right? Because your brain wasn't designed to stay heightened that long. Yeah. And so of course you're going to run into some resistance or uncertainty or confusion. And the temptation is then to give orders. And so what we got to do is resist that temptation and continue to offer support yeah. because one of the things, one of the ways we can overcome that resistance is by empowerment. You know, well, let's make one decision, right? Mm -hmm. Let's make one decision before we leave the room today. Can we try that? Well, sure. Well, which one do you want to tackle? Here's five options. Which one would you like? Well, let's tackle it. Let's make it. We'll save the rest for later, right? Even just empowering victims in any way possible and then not getting frustrated with the uncertainty. Because I guarantee you, if you were in their place, you would be uncertain, confused uh, as well. And I love that you touched on the trauma because I mean, really and truly the trauma makes it, makes it uh, so that they do stay in this state of hypervigilance. They mm -hmm. stay confused. They, um, they really do. And like a lot of times they're not even sleeping at night. So they're, they really are having a hard time functioning. So the thought of going out and trying to find a job and facing all the huge obstacles they're going to face when they're not even really that functional because their minds right. are just not clear. Right. I mean, I know I've got women in, in our group that tell me they sleep maybe two to three hours a night, but they feel hyper alert all the time, yeah. have nightmares. They're, um, you know, just living on uh, adrenaline. Mm -hmm. And so that does make it very hard to function in, in the real world. And I, I heard uh, I heard Ellen Pence say one time, uh, God rest her soul. I heard Ellen Pence say one time that she could go into a women's group, a support group and say, everybody take out your meds. And there would just be pill bottles everywhere. And she'd go to a men's group and say, take out your meds. And there'd be like one bottle of uh, uh, hypertension medicine. And she used to joke that, um, not in a funny way, but in a peculiar way, that most of the diagnoses that her victims were experiencing were trauma-informed. And you probably should just take the meds they were taking and give them to the men's group. <laughs> she, would, she would jokingly share that. And I heard her say that several times. And I've, I've found that to be true over the years. Please don't take this as medical advice. Uh, please consult your doctor on things like that. But I have seen so many co-occurring presentation problems with victims, such as borderline um, bipolar disorder, um, um, uh, manic episodes that I, I suspect could be linked to trauma mm -hmm. uh, as, as opposed to being something else. Yeah. And I've seen, I've had a lot of them that were on so many meds just to try to numb themselves from the, the abuse that they were dealing with on a daily yeah. basis. And once they got out, they were able to wean themselves off. Mm -hmm. And even those diagnoses, bipolar depression, mm -hmm. Uh, you know, because that can be subjective sometimes per yeah. <laughs> therapist. Yeah. Um, a lot of times those disappeared. Their their diagnoses disappeared. So mm -hmm. that can yeah. happen. I've got and one of course, last. Re removing them and providing safety, sanity, yes. and progression and healing actually provides their doctor with a much broader canvas or a much broader picture of how to properly treat them. Mm -hmm. um, and so we never give medical advice. We never tell people to come off medication or deny a diagnosis. I don't want that to be the case here. I just want to hear, to hear, I want people to hear me say as advocates, we're addressing the abuse and we have seen as we address the abuse and as they're empowered to address the abuse in their own life, we've seen many of these things dissipate mm -hmm. um, because it's trauma informed or trauma uh, contributive. And even I wanted to say one quickly, uh, I found out recently that, um, or in the last year that ADHD, which yeah. a lot of children who live, grow up with domestic violence, uh, are diagnosed with uh, ADHD is actually those same, those symptoms are also the symptoms of living with, uh, trauma. So, um, I think a lot of kids get misdiagnosed and end up on medications just because they're living in so much stress in their homes. Mm -hmm. And then I have a, a last point here that they're afraid uh, that the abuse will get worse if they leave. And you and I both know that when so. leaves, a lot of that is the most dangerous time for a woman is after she leaves an abusive relationship. 75% of domestic violence homicides happen after separation. Yeah. Yeah. I can vouch for that. I I've had the, if the unique privilege, I guess privilege is the word of serving on our state's fatality review board. Um, and so I have, unfortunately, uh, reviewed 
I can't even, I don't even know how many now uh, domestic homicide cases uh, from the medical examiner to the law enforcement and so on down the line. And um, domestic homicide is real. It's a significant threat to women around the world. Um, and we are right to be concerned. And so even to go back to the first point that we made about the benevolent rescuer who comes in and, and gives well-meaning advice, leaving a situation without a safety plan and awareness from a group of people that care about you uh, is dangerous. Yeah. And so it, safety planning is so essential here because this is true that your risk of domestic homicide uh, increases quite a bit when you attempt to leave or institute those severe circumstances. Yeah. And in the same vein, I read a study that said that people, that women who access services are le much le less likely to be become victims of domestic violence homicide mm -hmm. simply because they had that plan in place. Yeah, that's in the 60 percentiles, I think. Um, our law enforcement officer uh, could tell you more about that. He's an expert on that, but it does uh, increase your um, your level of protection when you seek services. And again, I hate to sound like a broken record, but we actually have a dangerousness and lethality assessment training on PeaceWorks University with that law enforcement officer. He mentions those stats as long as the risk indicators uh, for homicide. And I have to go back one more time and just say that you, this person, the, the victim may have never experienced physical yeah. abuse. That's good. And if she leaves, it could become, or even if she bucks him. And I, I told this, I tell this story a lot and it's in my book, but um, when I was working at the domestic violence shelter, I was asked to go out to the house of this woman, um, you know, actually and being in real estate, they wanted me to go look at her house to sell it. And I walk in and there's this huge, you know, blood stain on the hardwood floors. Wow. And she is, she's got stitches all up and down her head. She's bruised all over. Um, she's got just big knots on her head. My, half, my, part of her hair is missing and where she's had to have surgery and had to have, have her head sewed up. And I said, well, tell me your story. And she said, well, um, we've been married for 30 years. There's never been any physical abuse. Um, and she said, but my husband, they had, they lived out on a 17 acre farm. And she said, my husband had a friend come out and he brought out his wife. And so they would go out hunting and she would talk to me and she saw the way he was treating me. So she said, you know, you'd really need to tell him, no, you don't, maybe you don't want that for dinner, you know, because yeah. this man was controlling with an iron, you know, hand. And he said, mm -hmm. you know, he made all the decisions. So one day when nobody was there, but them, she decided to just say, you know what? I don't think I want that for dinner. And when she did, he went into the kitchen, he got a, a, a skillet, an iron skillet and started hitting her in the head. And if she had not fallen down behind the recliner in the living room, she would not have lived yeah. to talk about that. Wow. And that was, there was never any physical abuse. That's the same thing that happened with uh, Carol and Cruz, who's on our board. Mm -hmm. She had not had any physical abuse. And you know, when she left, I mean, this lady didn't even leave. She just told him no one day. Yeah. So we, this is why we can never, ever take this too lightly. Right. You never underestimate the potential danger. Um, when, we're, when we've got these uh, signs, we should have put up a power and control wheel. But if you mm -hmm. haven't um, accessed a power and control wheel, if you're looking at a relationship that is characterized by those things on the power and control wheel, intimidation, emotional abuse, financial abuse, sexual abuse, um, male privilege. You missed it. Finish them for me there, Chris. Oh, uh, emotional abuse, uh, minimization, denial, and blame. Isolation. Isolation, coercion. And minimizing and blaming others. Yeah. So when you've got a relationship that is characterized by many of those uh, things on the power and control wheel, it doesn't have to be every one of them, mm -hmm. then there's always a potential for danger. So um, we just wanted to um, do this video because um, in, in my opinion, uh, there's a lot of bad advocacy happening out there. Um, and we want to be able to really protect those yeah. who are victimized. And um, so if you want to learn more, Chris and I both have websites you can go to. Our, ours is called to peace.org. Um, we both also have books. Uh, mine is really written more for victims and Chris's has actually written about uh, it more about addressing the hearts of men who do use domestic violence in the home. And we've already mentioned his website, chrismoles.org, where you'll find the wonderful Peace Works University. Peace Works University yeah. <laughs> but uh, I really appreciate um, you, Chris, and I appreciate all you've done to help women to advocate for them. And um, 
So I think that got any last words you want to say? Oh, I, I love you too, Joy, and called to peace. And uh, for anybody that is considering uh, working as a people helper, I, I do think training and education are a huge piece. You don't know what you don't know. And we want uh, well-trained, well, you know, thoughtful, wise advocates. You don't have to know everything, right? Uh, but we, we do want to just encourage you to receive more education, perhaps through your state's uh, domestic violence coalition, perhaps through Call to Peace or PeaceWorks University, uh, or through just continued growth through reading and education. And, and this is where it happens. Unfortunately, there's not a whole lot of programs out there doing advocacy training, uh, but there are resources available to you. And so keep up the good work. Uh, if you're out there working with victims, uh, don't give up. Don't be scared. Keep providing support and encouragement. But yeah, don't, don't give up on learning. There's a lot uh, of work to be done, and we certainly would uh, benefit from the help. I keep saying, and I think Joy's on board with me. And I, honestly, I'm telling you, buddy, in the last six months to a year, I'm more encouraged by this than ever. Uh, yeah. The church will be the safest place mm -hmm. on the planet. It yes. will happen. And it's going to happen because people uh, stand in the gap because yeah. they, uh, they love the oppressed and they uh, want to see uh, the judgment of God or the mercy of God uh, applied to the oppressor, depending upon uh, yeah. whether repentance is present. So, Amen. And seen. Amen. <laughs> All right. Now I got to end it, but I was going to say one more thing. <laughs> <laughs> this is our, this is every conversation we have. folks. Oh, wait, one more thing. Oh, wait, one more thing. All right. We're really going to end it on that because I can't remember what it was now. <laughs> Thank you all for joining us.